Welcome everyone to this session about why cross browser and device platforms are ripe for destruction by Raghav and Abhig Ambiganandan. Uh, we are glad they can join us today. Uh, without further delay, over to you, Raghav. Good morning, you know, good afternoon, good evening to everyone uh, from wherever you are joining. Um, my name is Raghav Ambiganandan, and um, I'm a principal software engineer in Expedia. And today, the topic I'm going to talk about is um, why cross browser and device platforms are ripe for disruption. So, the SaaS platform, cross browser and device platforms, are used um, where they provide um, different browsers, different browser types, different browser versions, different uh, operating, um, different operating systems um, or versions, mobile devices, mobile um, uh, browser versions, and etc. Now. Why this topic? Uh, basically, you know, what is what was acceptable two years ago um, wasn't acceptable last year. What was acceptable last year uh, is not acceptable today. It could be speed, it could be cost, it could be futures, mainly because technology is evolving so fast that unless we adapt to it, we are going to miss out so many things, so much uh, of a positive things. And that's what um, this is, I'm going to talk about like a positive disruption. So uh, this is a, a small introduction about myself, my profiles in LinkedIn and Git repo and uh, Twitter and my blog. Uh, I've been in this industry for almost 20 years now. Uh, I did start as a test automation engineer and I like it and I've, I've been in, in the industry for 20 years now. Uh, I speak, my first conference was Selenium um, 2015 in Oregon. I write, I mentor people. Uh, this is one way I give back to the community, my knowledge and my experience. So what is the problem description of this talk? Um, uh, as I mentioned before, Cross-processed device platforms are not built to handle real scalability that shift left requires in a cost efficient way. Now, what is shift left? Shift left is the ability to validate your change even before you merge your pull request instead of validating them after you merge and to the right side of the pipeline. You want to do that anything, any test, any test automation, very close to the code, which means that requires high scalability. Why you need high scalability is because you need to get faster feedback cycle as well. So, the, and, and the ability of the current SaaS platform to align with some of the key components of best practices of software engineering is lacking. And that's what we're going to discuss and how and you know, what is the problem and how we can solve it. So the, uh, the talk is going to be split into six part where I'm going to first talk about what are the key ingredients of CACD pipeline? Because every one of you here, your core, the nucleus of why you're here is you want to have a very good pipeline that, that makes sure that your product reaches production, your, your application or anything, your code, your changes reaches production uh, faster and at the same time with really good quality. So everything we do revolves around the key ingredients or the best practices of CACD pipeline. And I'm, we are going to first look at that because the rest of the talk is going to revolve around that. The second is uh, the problems in current browser device platform. Like what are the things they are lacking, uh, which is not in alignment with the first point of key ingredients of CACD pipeline. The third one is the new use cases contributing to the problem. Things are changing. There are new browsers coming up. There are new things coming up. How these new use cases are adding support to our argument, you know, there is going to be a positive disruption and why uh, some of the features are lacking. And fourth one is evolution of supporting technology. Like, okay, we discussed a problem. We're also going to discuss the supporting technologies that I think could create solution for those problems we are discussing. And uh, the fifth one is disappearing outliers. Uh, we're going to have a small, uh, you know, few slides on what 
actually created SaaS, uh, uh, you know, trend in the first place, and some of these are disappearing. And what is them? What are they? And test smart. Uh, you know, testing never, and testing never ends. It only stops. So how we can test smart is what we're going to discuss. So let's go into that topic. So the first one is key ingredients of a CADC pipeline, right? Any CACD pipeline, these are the six components that we want to achieve. You want to run, you want to fail often, which means you want to run tests frequently. If you fail often, then you will find issues you know, faster. You don't want to you know, change something and find next day. You want, you want to do, know it now. Focused microset test, which means you start from unit tests to any test you write to the, the, the top of the pyramid are focused tests that specifically focus on one particular thing. So when it fails, you know why it failed. The third one is test fast. This is linked to the first one. Unless you can test fast, you cannot fail often. Because imagine you, you, you are running your pipeline and if it takes one hour to run your test, you cannot fail often because that's not test failing often. So for that, you need test fast where you have the ability to concurrently run your test, not for your team, for your project, for your entire organization. The fourth one is fail fast. You know, you don't want to wait for everything to complete. You want to fail fast, like whatever fails, immediately stop it. And the fifth one is shift lab. We already talked about it, but the point here is wherever, whatever you run to fail often, whatever you test relevant, whatever you run fast, whatever you fail fast, do them, run them close to the code before even you merge things um, to your main branch. That's shift left. And the sixth one is visualize test results. What is visualize test results is in one project alone, like in one pipeline, you might be deploying your changes probably 15 times a day, it depends on number of changes, number of teams, people in your team, but you don't have all the time in the world to go and look at all the failures every time they fail, because that's complete waste of time. We have technology, we can use machine learning to bubble up things that are relevant, that are actually customer uh, impacting problem and just bubble up. So you know, okay, these are the important problem I need, I need to look at. So visualizing and help easy debugging is another important. So these are the key ingredients. Now we are going to the next topic where we're gonna talk about what are the current problem in the SaaS platforms right now, which offer cross-browser, cross-device plan features. The course, if you wanna go and use someone and the course is based on the number of parallel connections, which means you pay, I want to get one connection, I want to get 10 connections. If you get 10 connections, if your organization is big and you have 10 teams and each have lots of cases, then your concurrency across the organization is just 10, which means your test run are going to be slow. How fast you can go to production is going to be slow. How fast you get feedback for your change is going to be slow. So you're going to be slow because of this business model. So the cost of your productivity, your quality, and how fast your change reach production depends on how much money your organization can afford to spend on it. So that's a one big problem. Second one is fixed costs, not based on actual usage. Imagine in last two years in COVID pandemic, and we are still in COVID pandemic, there are many Fortune 500, including Fortune 100 companies that didn't make even a single dollar for a few months. Do you think they will be ready to come and pay you something per month on a fixed basis or, a pay, or, or a, per year when they're not even making money, right? So this again of you pay something, but whether you use it or not, is not uh, reflecting the current nature and the current technologies. So you pay regardless of the usage is a problem. The third point of the current uh, you know, problem in the current uh, uh, SaaS platform is not suitable for shift lab use case. Because of the first point we saw about parallel connection, 
Shift left requires high scalability. We will see in detail now. So I don't want to run my tests, uh, you know, parallelly only after I merge. I want to run app for every branch. I want to run my cases for every commit so that I don't have problems later. So not just testing out to change your merge trunk, but for every commit to branch. And this requires scalability, high scalability that I doubt current platforms uh, are able to provide. So we're gonna dig deep into this, um, more deep into looking look into this use case. So I've been in the industry for 20 years and I know for like 10 years ago, you know, it's not a, a surprising news that people were even releasing once every six months. People were releasing once every three months. That was the norm. Mainly because there were no there was no concept of microservice or micro front ends. Your entire website was one monolith application. You make a sing, single change, it's not just go and push a small microservice to production, is you have to enter shift the entire code based to production. That's why you were releasing so um, slow. Things have changed. Things have changed. So if you look at this website, all these green circles might be a separate project, a micro front end with their own CACD pipeline and they go to production on their own. For customers, you might not see it. They are stitched together using a proxy in the background, but they are on their own. They are, they are handled by separate teams and they go to production on their own. Now, going deep further into this, if I map this into a CACD pipeline, then there are 50 teams, for example, it's just a theory, and each team has five people. You have a CACD pipeline. Each CACD pipeline will run 30 tests when, whenever you merge your pull request. For 30 tests to run sequentially, if it one test takes two minutes, it's going to be one hour. If they run in parallel, it might finish in two minutes, that's okay. But for an entire organization with 50 teams, the worst case, there might be 1,500 tests running concurrently. I, I agree that it will not happen because not every pipeline will run at the same time. Uh, the the chances are very, very low. Even if you take one third of the test, to run these in parallel against um, the current platform, it might cost you a million dollar or more, right? So, because if you need true uh, concurrency, if you need really fast feedback, then you need to buy at least say 700, 800 parallel connection. Now, what I showed you was a normal pipeline and let's go further into shift lab. So this is a slide from National Institute of Standards, Standards and Technology from US Department of Commerce. What it shows you is, Whenever you have a problem, uh, you find a problem when you are coding, then for fixing that, it costs five times the amount of fixing it you know, at the requirement stage or before that. But as you go for the right side of the pipeline, every time you find issues, you're gonna block people. More people need to get involved. You need to contact switch, especially in production, the cost is going to go up. What do you want to, test to the right side of the pipeline when you can do it at the coding, at the, at the close to the code for much cheaper price, right? So the same slide, but I have expanded for one team, which is doing shift left, which means in that particular team, there are five people and they are working on five branches and they want to run the test, deploy them and run the test on their branch or for every commit for one pipeline that requires 150 parallelization across the organization, around 7,500. 7, Again, even if you take one third of that, if you want to have true parallelization using SaaS platform, that's going to be a million dollars or you know, a, a few million dollars. I'm sure no CTO is going to sign a procurement deal worth that amount for cross uh uh, cross browser usage. So this is another view for the same where you can see different branches um, branch out every commit, take, um, you take a, a, the chain, deploy somewhere, test and uh, destroy the stack. Now, and for each um, 
<laughs> excuse me. For the each pipeline, you use your own you know, scalable grid and run your test. Excuse me. <laughs> The another reason uh, uh, why I think uh, uh, the uh, the problem is the platforms are fully dependent on <clears throat> expensive real devices. So um, there, there's no reason that why you have to test everything on real device. And um, <clears throat> depending on real device is actually increasing the cost uh, of um, buying the parallel connection and everything. So we're going to look at like, why is it important to run everything on real device or not? And, and I think it's not necessary. And that's another reason. The next one is <coughs> cloud -based, cloud based data center. If you are relying on data center, uh, your ability to scale to some of the use cases like shift flap, it's going to be limited. But if you are in cloud, you know, that could help um, reduce the cost and help align with the best practice of CICD pipeline. <clears throat> so we looked at what are the current problems in the current SaaS platform. Um, share your thoughts in the comments. The next topic uh, is what we're going to look at is what are the emerging use cases that is contributing to the problem we described? Right. So, uh, for example, um, the I, I don't know how many of you heard about in-app browser. In-app browser is a new way certain platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, Quora shows website on their native apps to keep users within their realm so they can track the usage and habits. For, for example, if you open eBay, for example, on Facebook native apps on your iOS uh, device, you will see something like this. This is not a real browser. This is <clears throat> something like a web view on Safari, I think. You can go all the way up to check out, you can buy things, and you will still within the realm of Facebook native app. You wouldn't go out. <clears throat> so I thought, you know, let's see, let's see how good it is. And I, I tried open my Gmail on uh, iOS Chrome. This is how it showed. <clears throat> and this is how it showed on the NAP browser. My point is, Akamai shows that the traffic on in-app browser is increasing. So companies advertise in Facebook, companies advertise in LinkedIn and Quora and everywhere. And, Majority of users are not going to disable this feature and land on actual browsers, which you can. But if normal users, they, if they don't know, you might have tested on Chrome and Safari and other things, but they're going to end up using your e-commerce site on Facebook in-app browser. Is it tested for that? How are you going to test that? So this argument is <clears throat> we are going to have further addition to what we have to add as part of the test coverage. So that's in, you know, this, this is a new use case. How would you even test it? Um, you need to have a Facebook app, probably, you know, uh, enter something and uh, open the site, or there's a way to simulate this uh, using web view or something like that. The next one is desktop is still the king of conversion. Why? If you look at uh, the mobile uh, traffic pattern, I think every uh, e-commerce site will say that, you know, mobile traffic is probably 60% and desktop is 40% or low. That's fine. But if you look at the conversion, what is a conversion is how many people are coming to your site and out of which how many people are actually buying something. So the global mobile conversion rate is 1.81 compared to desktop which is 1.98. So even though it's less customers, desktop is giving you more money compared to mobile. So it's not that just because desktop traffic has decreased, you, you can reduce the coverage, but desktop is giving you more money. So you still need to increase or keep uh, the same coverage rate uh, on desktop browsers. 
So, and I think this trend is going to be saturated at one point because people will try to buy something on mobile. And once um, they know what they want to do, they go back to uh, desktop and uh, buy it because it's sometimes your funnel might be complex. <clears throat> the next one is um, the release schedule of Chrome Firefox Edge. Uh, release every probably once every five weeks. Um, <clears throat> so if uh, excuse me, so if um, your if your if your um, website is sensitive to changes um, between versions of browsers then you might need to uh, test it, not just on the latest minus one or latest, but probably latest minus two. Majority of customers are either um, on latest or latest minus one, because um, you know most regular users don't know how to go and disable auto update. So, and also the browser uh, uh, releases are based on uh, faces. So that's why 80% of customers are either on latest or latest minus one. So again, this might require you to increase your coverage, uh, and but it's very subjective. So <clears throat> the next uh, use case, what I think um, is supporting the argument is region-specific process. <clears throat> uh, why region-specific process, right? If you look at in the past, any e-commerce website, uh, big companies, the revenue is probably 60, more than 60% coming from North America. But the trend has changed now where most revenues, more than probably 50 is coming from non-North American countries. It doesn't mean the revenues started decreasing in North America, but it just means that revenue is growing in non-North American countries, mainly because standard of living is high, the economy is growing, people want to experience new things, people want to travel. <laughs> So which means, for example, in Vietnam, there's a Coco browser. It's still based on Chromium, but it's a customized browser. You see browser in China, India, you can see the usage. You see browser in Indonesia, Yandex browser in Russia. Uh, you can see the trend is close to Firefox. Even though they are based on Chromium, I always follow this approach create a pattern and follow the pattern. That might be take you to something and that this might predict you what's going to be in the future. And by the time, uh, and this is uh, the uh, Chinese, the web browser market in China uh, for uh, desktop, you can see that QQ and Sogo browsers are a uh, reasonable um, uh, piece. And also for mobile, you know, Chrome is nowhere to be seen, it's just 8%. Right. So, um, and by the time I see, I thought like, okay, there's not gonna be any new browsers. Brave and Vivaldi are, you know, based on Chromium, Brave focused on um, a security, privacy, and Vivaldi on uh, customization. But there's a new browser called Flow. N new rendering engine, not based on Chromium. Right now it's only available in uh, Raspberry Pi. But this is a trend, right? I always think no technology or no tool is too big to become obsolete, right? Um, so, you know, this is a new browser. What are we going to do with this, right? So these are some of the new use cases. Um, uh, and, um, so now we are going to look at evolution of new technologies. So we saw the problems, but these technologies are going to help us solve those problems that we cannot currently, um, that we are experiencing right now on the SaaS platforms. These two are not new, they are already existing. The AWS Bare Metal or equivalent in Google Cloud or Azure, AWS Windows, that allows you to scale, for example, Android emulators. Right, AWS browsers, you can use AWS Windows and you can scale it. 
New technologies, for example, AWS EC2 Mac instance. AWS has released for the first time, I think a year ago, a Mac 1 method, which allows you to scale and run, for example, iOS simulator, iOS Safari, Mac OS X Safari, because its, it's um, usage is really, really increasing. Although it is only right now provided as a dedicated instance, but it's still, you know, to some extent, scalable. There's a new trend of lots of Mac Mini Cloud, which is equivalent to AWS Linux, but Mac Mini Clouds. Right now, it's primitive where people use it only for using it as a remote Mac uh, 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 machine, or um, they use it as a um, um, uh, for like uh, Linux, uh, sorry, uh, Jenkins agents and things like that. But there is a new pattern emerging. For example, Mac Stadium Orca is a proprietary uh, tool where um, you can run OSX on Kubernetes, right? Uh, but you might think like, hey, why not use Hacking Torch? Uh, I think Diego uh, covered it because uh, as an organization, uh, legally, you know, it is not a good idea to use Hackintosh where running Mac on Linux. That is, according to Mac's, Apple's terms and condition, you shouldn't be doing that. As I said, no technology is too big to become obsolete. I know for a fact there are top in, in, in uh, universities like IIT in, the, in uh, India, Stanford, people are working on a new technology which takes best of, best of both worlds, VM and container. The outcome is going to be, it, it, it could change, not just cross process, but entire cloud in, in industry. Where, for example, Selenium Hub image, uh, Docker image, if it takes one GB with this, it might be like one MB or less. So imagine the speed at which you can instantiate and move faster. Imagine the amount of storage we're gonna save. So my point is we shouldn't sleepwalk. We should open our mind, look at technology and see how we can make use of it. So what are the disappearing outliers? <clears throat> so if you look at you know many, many years ago, um, IE was a very unique browser. Right, compared to the rest of them. I know uh, Microsoft provided a virtual desktop where you can go and you know, use IE. But even Microsoft realized that you know, it's not gonna be useful. They uh, started using Chromium-based Edge, right? And IE 11 itself support ends uh, on June 15, 2022 on certain OS version. MS Edge legacy support already ended. So these, the, IE is one of the main reasons why the SaaS platform started evolving and that itself is disappearing. And this is one less thing to worry about. So um, <clears throat> this is the disappearing outliers. Uh, is, uh. The next one is test smart. Do we have to test the change on everything, right? Testing never ends, it only stops. So how smart we can test, how cost efficient we can test. For example, you have a chain. Do you have to test on every browser on Windows, every browser on Mac, every browser on mobile devices, every, every uh, on iOS and Android? You will, you will never, you know, finish that. It will be insane to do that. It's not smart. So the way I normally say is, first test your change on a on a browser that convert more, and then take a small subset and. Uh, tested on browser. So I, I thought to produce a, a proof by induction, where in maths, there's a concept of induction, where mathematical induction proves that we can climb as high as we like on a ladder by proving that we can climb onto the bottom rock first. Don't worry about the upper layers. Can I climb to the first one? And then from each rock, we climb up to the next one, right? So if you take that concept to automation, base case, Prove that statement for n is equal to zero without assuming any knowledge of other cases. I don't want to worry about can I, can my chain work on browsers. I want to first worry about base case. Can my can, can my test your change on a browser and prove that code change is working? Is my code change working? Right. I just want to prove that my code change is working on a browser. Imagine that as a left hand side of part of the equation. On the right hand side, then you worry about okay. I know for the fact that my code chain is working and every case passed 
and can that chain my work on XYZ browser? And I don't have to run the entire suit, just pick important ones and run on your top browsers. So this is uh, another way to look at, does your code chain work on a browser? Yeah, so the code chain work. Now you check if it works on your browser with a small subset of changes. So this is a test pyramid for um, every change. Um, so you can see that um, Chrome is used for step one. Um, then you can use Chrome emulator for all responsive tests. And if you have Edge, uh, Firefox, Safari, iOS emulator, iOS emulator, and then use real devices for every code change. And this will help you with the scalability that requires when you move to shift left, when you want to run fast, when you want to fail fast, that key ingredients we saw in the CACD pipeline. The same slide, but different uh, mapping to different uh, rendering engines and JavaScript uh, engines where you can see that we are not missing anything. Right? So this is the uh, idea that um, you know, we are looking into. And um, this is one, one of the example I want to give. For example, you have um, you know, different breakpoints of your page. Do you have to actually um, run this on real device to figure out your responsive page is working? No, you don't have to. You can just use Chrome Emulator. We have to be really smart to use the technology, understand it instead of sleepwalking and thinking, I want to use what everyone is using. Just think and ask why 100 times before you know, start using something. So <clears throat> real device is not a solution for everything, right? So the positive disruption um, and, and the use cases and the solution and other things you saw can be mapped to this test and project pyramid. So it could be SaaS, on-premise, it could be any cloud solution, and on top, have an orchestration engine, a container platform, Selenium, APM, or any other framework, Ingress, real device. This will help you scale, not your team, not just your project, across your organization, across any organization, this model will help you scale and stick to and adhere to the best practices of the software engineering of shift left and failing fast and uh, run fast and et cetera. This is an example where your infrastructure might be running on AWS, CG, uh, Google Cloud or Azure, and you can use the orchestration engine and cloud uh, and Docker and everything to create and scale, run your test, destroy it, and you repeat that. And it fully in a fully order scalable fashion. It could be uh, browsers, it could be uh, mobile emulators, uh, simulators, uh, it could be anything. And it could be repeatable, not just for your team, for within your team, for multiple branches, across many teams, across the entire organization, there's no limit on parallelization. There's no limit on how fast you can run, right? That's the key thing. That's what everyone is striving for, right? How fast I can reach to production. How fast I know if my change has caused production issues or not. How fast I can know if my change is going to break the pipeline and everyone waiting until I fix it. How can I, how fast I can context switch? Right. Even if you can save four hours per pull request, that's a lot of time across the entire year. So this is what um, you know, this is trying to achieve. So now, <clears throat> what, what you should expect from a SaaS platform, um, besides adhering to the, um, the key ingredients of a CACD pipeline, as an output, what are the things we should look for? A, it should save money, auto scale infrastructure, pay only for what's used, maximum ex expenditure on cross browser platform, minimize minimum expenditure on cross browser platform. Second thing is make money. You should be able to go to production really, really fast, not just goes to production, but with the quality code. These two are business interests. Business people will be really love this. What is there for engineers is save time. Execute multiple test cases across multiple browsers concurrently. 
no limit of concurrent test run, save time to pull request feedback cycle, and complete test run within a few minutes instead of a few hours. Enable shift left. Avoid production incidents. Help you test each one of your changes in true CACD script. So help each test each help test each pull request super fast. So every commit can be tested, right? Multiple PRs can be tested concurrently. So these two are for engineers and they would love it. And visualizing as I talked about, so that you can bubble up and figure out what are the actual fa failures that, that impacts customer. And accelerate change. I, I know things are changing. They get help to accelerate change, right? Things are changing. Definition of our roles have changed and it is continuously changing. So the challenge is to not stick there and complain, but to understand and pivot, right? There's a proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, right? The second best time to plant a tree is right now. So if you have a problem, if you sit and wait that somebody else is going to come and solve, nobody's, come and go, nobody's going to come and solve for you. So if this is our problem, so we have to solve it. So that's a talk on uh, the positive disruption. Uh, thank you for listening and thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Raghavan. That was a great talk. Very, very informative. And uh, we are open for questions now. Okay, while well, people are typing in the question, okay, we have a question from Pooja Shah. I will just read that out to you. Uh, could you please share the most challenging pain points of inculcating the culture of shift left? I believe shift left and uh, what worked and what did not work? So, uh, <clears throat> good question. Uh, if you want to shift left, right? You may be a director, you may be a manager, you may be a senior director, VP, you may be CTO, CEO, right? You can go and tell a team saying shift left, do everything close to the code. It will work for one month, two months, and that's it. If you want to have a real successful shift left, you need to have a change in mindset. You need to build champions within each team who could take that and then go and implement it. The way we have implemented within Expedia is we build champions within individual teams. We identified who, who would like to, uh, you know, are in the same wavelength and make them understand and create them champion and implement and have them as part of the solution, help them, you know, use it as a community effort. Then they will go back to the team and then drive it. No authority, nobody's going to help you change it. It's the mindset and champions, creating champions within every team and make uh, empower them to go and change. And that's the only way you can have a successful shift lab. Sounds very sensible. And uh, I hope that answers Pooja's question. We have one more question from Ashwin Satyanarayanan. Uh, how do you group tests for other browsers? So I think it's very uh, subjective. Um, uh, but it's it suits your individual cases. For example, uh, imagine you have you know five different page, right? For your case one, in my case as an induction step one, I might I will be running everything, right? I want to make sure that my code change is working. I don't care about browsers now. But for browsers, I might have a um, a test like a small end to end test. I can can I go all the way up to the funnel, right? And probably, um, can I go to this page, uh, one particular page, and do certain things? Because I'm, I'm already confident my code change is right. I just need to make sure a small sanity smoke test I can do on iOS Safari. So how do I choose? It's, it's just your scope. If you have five pages in your funnel, make sure that you can actually, you have two tests per page or something like that. That's what I would do if, if you are if me here. Makes sense. I had a question myself. Uh, any uh, recent developments in the device form area that you've noticed that is already like making changes that we can adopt already, or uh, um, 
which were in the place where I'm coming from is, of course, I could use the, uh, uh, you know, embedded browser, but uh, is there a way to sort of cross that chasm between real devices and actually having embedded browsers? Uh, any cheaper alternative than the actual expensive device? So um, I think um, some of the solutions, for example, uh, uh, AWS is providing Mac Metal, right? If we can have a way to um, run I I iOS simulator and make sure it's part of the grid, and you know, then you can scale it like any any how you want. Um, and for Android, Android, there's no problem of running on Linux, so you can easily already scale it. You can containerize it, containerize it, and uh, add it as part of your Selenium grid um, and use an orchestration platform. And that's it. That's a perfect equation as part of the infrastructure uh, pyramid. Uh, however, I believe there's no vendor who's already packaging this as a service yet. If I'm not wrong. Correct. I, I, you, you might be right. So I don't know how, how many are providing uh, the simulator and emulator. Uh, the, basically, the cost uh, or the business model is the problem. So, yeah. Okay. Understood. Thanks for that. All right, we're just about uh, reaching time. So I'd quickly like to uh, thank Raghavan for sharing his experience with us today.